for choosing this podcast by New Heights Fellowship Baptist Church of East Toledo. In this podcast, look for Reverend R.J. Shope. He's a relatively new, relatively young Christian preacher coming out of Toledo and New Heights Fellowship Baptist Church of East Toledo. He's speaking out of Genesis 3, 1 through 6, talking about uh, the deception and not being part of the deception, not being deceived. And so enjoy, learn, grow, reach New Heights in Jesus. There's been, not only has there been a lot of viruses and stuff going around, this little flu bugger thing that hit everybody, it seemed like, last week, or a lot of folks, and some folks got it this morning, so we're praying for those who are, uh, hey, say at home in the bathroom, or home in bed, or whatever this morning, dealing with that virus, and, and other health concerns that we have amongst us as well, and so we're praying that uh, God will see us through. I believe if we ask, He shall. He will answer, and He will do it, and uh, we'll be... Uh, that means on the other side of it, our systems will be stronger. Our bodies will be reset. And that's the way it is with all adversity. We forget that sometimes. We learned it a few weeks ago in the sermon. And I'm sure you've read it in the Bible or heard it from somebody at some point. But when you face adversity, you get stronger. On the other side, we are stronger for what we've been through. We think of, we always say of wounds and scars and aches and pains and how they tend to last. But even a wound or a scar or an ache or a pain will make you stronger. Uh, you learn to, to cope with it or to overcome it and to become a more effective human being. And so praise God for our difficulties, although that's hard. I want to remind you today, uh, this was in my heart um, yesterday and this morning, that we are New Heights Fellowship Baptist Church. Those of you who are here part of the church, you are New Heights Fellowship Baptist Church, which means we are reaching New Heights in Jesus, and we talk about that all the time, and we need to continue, and we will continue talking about that all the time, how we learn from Jesus, about Jesus, and the things we're supposed to do, and pass that information on to others. But we mustn't forget that Jesus taught us fellowship. He taught uh, spending time with Him. He says, I am with you, and you're with me. In fact, if we are not in Him, we can do literally nothing. And so it's fellowship with Him. But then it's also fellowship with one another. If you look at Jesus' model, this is His model. I'm going to get to you real simply. Number one, He had fellowship with all of His disciples. Number two, His disciples had fellowship with each other. 
And then they together and Jesus all have fellowship with God the Father. And that's sort of the model. It's what we're after. It's what we're about. And so we reach the heights in Jesus as we fellowship with one another. You got something to get over? Well, guess what? Everybody else in this room has something to get over too. You got something to push through? Guess what? Everybody else in this room has something to push through too. But we come together today to unite in our effort to glorify God. So I want you to make sure before you leave this place that you shake somebody's hand, that you give somebody a hug, give somebody a word of encouragement, or pray in your, let your heart be poured out for others who are going through difficulties and struggles just the same as you are. And I think that, that sometimes our salvation, our hope, our uh, advancement is in going out for someone else, praying for someone else, hoping for their best, loving them, and wanting what's next for them. Okay? When you do that, sometimes it clicks for you, and you can do what you're supposed to do. All right? So we're going to pray together at this time, and then this is a worshiping about God, but together. We are together in this room. So there are people in this room, you don't know their name, they came here for the same reason you did. To worship God, to hear from God, to grow, and to become what it is that we're supposed to be. So that's our goal. All right? So let's pray together, and then we'll do a little worship of the Lord. Father in heaven, we gather today under the auspices of an almighty God. We know, Lord, that you are in charge of all things. We, we have seen the shipwreck that we have made of this life. We have known the errors of our ways and the results thereof. We have seen it in our lives and the lives that we love. And we know that the chiefest, the most extreme of those errors would be to not acknowledge you. And so we first come acknowledging you, God. You are in charge. We recognize that. You are on the throne. We recognize that. You have all power. We recognize that. We declare today that you are in charge of all things. We recognize and acknowledge your authority over us. At the same time, Lord, we confess to you our need for healing, our need for forgiveness, the mistakes that we have made, they say that you are not in charge. They say that we were in charge, or that we thought someone else was in charge, or money was in charge, or something we wanted was in charge. And that's just not true. We have denied your authority over us, and we confess it to you, and we ask your forgiveness, and then we know, Lord, that you saw that coming 2,000 years ago when Jesus went to the cross, and you took care of it. And so we're claiming the promises of your word that you have forgiven us through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for taking care of us through the past adversities and the things that we face. For helping us to overcome. For giving us a desire in our hearts to worship you and learn from you and walk with you. We thank you for this place, the physical trappings of a church. When we have a building, we have chairs, we have carpet, we have instruments. We thank you for the skills and the aptitude and and the gifting that you put in this people to honor you when we come together. Lord, we could just thank you all day long. We've got so many things to thank you for. We could thank you for every atom, for every wind, for every rain, for every sunset and every sunrise, for every cloudy day. Lord, we got a lot to thank you for, and we thank you for all of it, even though we probably never could. We ask you, Lord, to watch over us now as we worship you. Help us lift our voices and sing, even when we don't know the words, or even when our heart aches a little over something we've been through. Lord, just help us be about you during this time. And then, Lord, help us, uh, as, a, as little people, help us be patient. And as adults, help us be patient with the little people. And, Lord, all of us, help us wait on you to act, to work, to do what you would do. Lord, help the instrumentalists today. They've got lives. They've got things going on in their lives. We always look up at the stage and we think, well, they're ready to play. It's just amazing how God gets them to do that. Yeah, there's a lot of hard work. Lord, we know there's a lot of hard work. We're grateful for the hard work that they've put in. We're grateful for the overcoming that they've done. We're grateful that normal humans can serve in this capacity to worship the living God. Because they can, we know we can. And so we ask you to unite us today so that we are no different, just humans praising you. And we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, we're going to get on our feet this morning because you can't dance sitting down. Well, <laughs> I mean, you can up, try. Your hand well, and you stand up. Children, can I congregate towards Switch the front or can make them move your arms? I'm not going to whack you. need your arms. <laughs> I can whack her. It's okay. All right. All right, I'm going to put the juice down so you can do some motions. Here we go. Close it up.
All right, so we've been emphasizing study. We're going to do it a different way today. So we have every six months, we focus on a discipline, right? Nicole, thank you for making it. I couldn't get to you. Like, I don't know why it's like these big metal things on wheels just blocking the whole community. It was terrible. I tried to get Nicole earlier, and the trains were blocking away, so she made it in. Praise God. Okay. Um, anyway, so... Uh, it's a discipline of study. So before we even get into this, I want to ask you, does anybody have any habits or things that you found that you've done over the years and you just got like, I, I, I have to do it every day? Not Bible habits, but just in general in your life. Uh, we went, went to, I'll give you an example real quick. Went to the doctor's office with Sherry and they were doing a consultation for the shots that she's probably going to get for her neck and her shoulder because of of the pain that she has and it's inflammation in there. And the doctor and the nurse said, do you, do you drink any caffeine? And she said, coffee every morning. And I had, it hadn't really struck me, but she does. She makes coffee every morning. She mixes it with other stuff to the point that she drinks coffee every morning. And the nurse said, me too. All right, so let's try Let's see that one nice and easy. All right, who drinks coffee every morning? I'm not raising my hand, okay? I see quite a few hands, okay, quite a few hands. And some very young people. Be careful if you're real young drinking a lot of coffee, but coffee every morning probably helps you wake up. Be careful about too much coffee when you're young. Okay. All right. Who's got another one? What's something you do pretty much every day? Lynn. Road rage. You road rage every day? Yes. Okay. Maybe that comes from the caffeine. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. What else? Let's get a list going here. Like something you do every day. Take vitamins. Take vitamins. Okay. You take vitamins every day. That's a good example, actually. That's exactly what we're going to talk about. Go ahead. Something you do every day. Eat cereal. Eat cereal. You eat cereal for breakfast pretty much every day or sometime every day. Perfect example, right? So, like, when I, when I was, by the way, when I grew up, when I was growing up, I literally ate cereal every day, seven days a week. I'm, I, like, I'm more made of cereal than probably any other food in existence because I love cereal and always have. Okay, go here. Say it again. Watching TikTok. So she's she developed a habit of watching TikTok. Okay. Change diapers. Change diapers every day. Guess what? Not forever. Pretty soon. Right. Yeah. There's going to be a moment in time where that's going to take a gap. But I have changed diapers yes. every day. Yes. So but it, there will be a gap in that, and then maybe again, and then maybe a gap, and then eventually grandparents. You know, I changed, I changed diapers for a little while there. Okay. Video games. Video games virtually every day. Yeah, I bet you do. Probably got that little allotment, and then you're every. I bet every day you ask for an extra hour. What do you think? Is that probably <laughs> true. Yeah, just about every day. Okay, so you get the gist of it, right? Some things develop. Now, if we went with why that's true, if we went with why each one of those things is true, why we do it, right? Then we can say, well, our personality. It's just who I am. I like the taste of it. I, I can, every day I get in that situation. Like if you've got a child who needs a diaper change or you got somebody cutting you off in traffic, like every day you get in that situation. So then every day you wind up doing that thing. Sometimes it feels like it's outside your control, but the truth is it's kind of, it really isn't, right? A lot of, you got one? Of what? I don't know what that is. Sleeping? Yes, that's good. Do you sleep at pretty much the same time every day? Yeah, see, there you go. All right, Jason, quick. Drawing virtually every day, yeah. Okay, so we're done with the list of things that we do every day, but understand that you do them because of kind of who you are. Now let's talk about Bible study. This is our discipline for the six months, all right? So if we relate those same things, example. If you said, well, I do this every day because I like the taste of it, okay? So in Scripture, there's actually a biblical teaching that says, if you love God, you will like devouring God's Word. You will like taking it into yourself, all right? So if you say, but I read my Bible and I don't enjoy it, okay? then that's where you have to get into why don't I enjoy reading the Bible? Why don't I enjoy understanding more of what God wants me to know? That kind of thing, right? So you have to ask yourself those questions and figure out why that's true. But assuming you do enjoy it, then the question is, why wouldn't you do it every day? All right? Typically, the why nots are harder than the whys. So we say, well, why do we eat cereal every day? Well, for one, we have to eat, and we like the taste of it. All right? So as a Christian, 
You can deny it if you want, but the truth is you have to intake God's Word. God's Word is like food for Christians. It is bread for your soul. You have to do it. All right? So you say, well, I have to do it, but I don't always like the taste of it. Well, you have to figure out why that might be, but the Word says you will like the taste of it if you love God and want to know more of what God wants to do. You will like this. So if you have to do it and you like the taste... Then, then you're back to the same. You can eat the word. Not, don't actually eat the paper, although that's the illustration, right? But, but you can eat the word for the same reasons that you eat cereal every day. Okay. Um, if you talk about why do you take caffeine? Well, I like the taste of coffee. It wakes me up. It helps me get my my energy flowing, so I can do the physical work I have to do, or so I can stay. It helps my focus. All those things are true. And you can literally say all of those things of. Taking in the word, right? So when you get in a spiritual warfare, if you have not read your Bible for, or studied your Bible for a week or so, you're going to be less equipped. Have you ever had a period of time in your life, I know there's some people in the room that would say, where you have taken in a lot of the Bible. You've read a lot, written down a lot, studied a lot, memorized a lot of the Bible. Has that happened to you? Okay, I know Tony Tate's nodding yes, Ron's nodding yes, you better be nodding yes. We did a ton of that to pass the wand and stuff like that. Tony and June. Anybody ever worked on a WANA program, it's literally like that, right? It's being spewed at you all the time. You're studying it. WANA people are encouraged to study it themselves, memorize it, right? And you're in the, in, this is what's ironic. Back in the day, back in the day, we had the little, in WANA, we had the little books, and the little book said, okay, to memorize this, write this down. You know what that's called when you're trying to memorize it and you wrote it down? Study. It just turned into study. It went from being just memorizing to also studying because you start writing, okay, and and then you retain more. So if you ha- so when if you had a period, and let's just say it was a while ago, I'm not picking anybody out, but let's just say it was a while ago that you had this period where you spent a lot of time picking up the Bible, reading it, memorizing it, studying it, writing it down, right? Do you have remnants left in you now from that time? Do you remember bits of it? You do, right? So it becomes like food, like fuel for your life going forward. It becomes like that. You take it in, later you, and this is what happens to me, and I know this is the way it works, but I'll be in a situation, I need to know what God wants me to do, and a verse that I don't even know, I couldn't find it in the Bible, I can't quote it exactly, but I know basically what it says will pop in my head. And I, and I know that's the way God speaks to us. Okay, That's one of the ways that God speaks to us. So, but hey, if you're not interested in going to a hand-raising church, you want to go... Buy off. Thank you. So, um, if you are following, if you're tracking with what I'm saying here, then you understand you need to make a plan or have some steps. The thing becomes a discipline when you make a plan or have some steps. So, is there anybody in the room that works out? I can raise my hand. I say, yay, look at this. We have about a third of us. So, yeah, and some of us go, eh. Right? We should be. I know I was. I should. I should. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, t- it tends to work out eventually, right? Uh, okay, so you ever pick up a weight, let's say you pick up a weight and you're going to curl it. How do you know how many times you're going to curl it? What, what, how do you make the decision? What? You set it in advance, right? Or say you did, and, and that's probably based on what? Could be. That's not the best way to go, but that is a way to do it. Based on your goals. Okay, it could be based on your goals. All right, so so far we've got to get tired or based on your goals. Ricky, how do you set how many reps you do with, what, what weight do you curl? I don't necessarily curl. Okay, what weight, what, give me a weight thing that you do. So, based on my max. Okay, based on your body weight. Yeah, well, based on how much I can lift, I just go a little bit lower so I can keep that. Okay, so you know how much you can, and you go a little bit lower than that, so that you can keep going, so you can do reps, right? Got it? All right, so what if you decided, I can read the Bible, I can read for this period of time, so I'm going to go a little bit lower than that, so that I won't give up, right? That's, it's called discipline. Let's say you say, well, I, can, I know if I wanted to, I could do my reading, I could Bible read 10 minutes a day, I mean, it would, I'll have to break some, I'll have to crack some eggs open, I'll have to change my schedule, I'll have to work hard to get there, but I could go 10 minutes a day, and I could read 10 minutes every day, and write some things down. Let's say you could do that, okay? But if you could do 10 minutes a day, 
then you might have to say, but that is a lot. It's pushing me. I'm going to back it off to five minutes a day, and then I should actually be able to do five. And then you can say to yourself, look, I know I can do more, so I'm not going to fail to do five. Right? Because I know I could do more, so I'm not going to fail to do five. And that's what you do. And then you do five every day or every part of every day. Okay? I started doing workouts, and, and I, I keep my uh, weights that I do lower, like Ricky does, lower than what I can actually do so I can do reps. And I wasn't even thinking about that until you said it, but that is how I do it. And then I realized I was, I was doing a lot of reps, and it was going to be so many reps that I was getting bored. So then I increased the weight a little bit because I was getting bored. Okay? And maybe you'll do that. You'll read your Bible and you'll go, okay, I'm doing five minutes a day, every day. I'm faithfully doing it. But I could do more. So I'm going to do five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night. Right? That's how, and there's a lot of steps. I'm not giving you the pattern. You have to figure out how to do it for yourself. But there's a lot of steps to discipline. Okay? Um, in this room, there are people that believe if, you are, if it starts at 1 p.m. and you get there at 1 p.m., you're late. You should, the military teaches that, by the way. One, on time is late. And there are people in this room that believe that if you get there at 1 o'clock, you're on time. And there are people in this room that basically believe that if you get there at 105 and it started at 1 o'clock, you're just, uh, what do they call that? Fashionably. Fashionably late. So you're not technically late. It's what's expected. Right? So people have different, so you figure out what your attitude is about study and you discipline yourself the way you discipline yourself to study, okay? I was, and I'm gonna be transparent, I was having trouble studying every day. I have, and I have had trouble off and on for decades, so since I got saved. Like, I would say I'm gonna to study today, but by the time I got around to studying, I was so tired, I'd pick up my Bible and start to read, and I'd fall asleep, okay? And sometimes that was like noon. You're like, I was tired, it's been a long week or whatever, and I'd be like, oh, I better study, and I'd get my Bible, and I'd fall asleep. And then I'd wake up, and all the time, plus some, that I had spent, decided I was going to study, gone. It's like that. I'm like, oh, great, now i got to go, or I'm going to be late to whatever's next, right? And the study time is gone. So for me, I said, I'm going to study in the, I started saying I'm going to study in the morning. When I first wake up, yeah, I'm tired, but I'm not going back to sleep. So I first wake up before I do anything else, before I eat, before I have my cereal, before I get in my car, before anything can affect or anything can do, can stand in the way. But for you, what is your pattern, okay? Now, what I'm asking you to do, and this is, I'm not trying to push you, force you to do anything that you don't want to do or what's not good for you, okay? As between now and next week, I want you to think about and pray about it. What is your pattern? What are you going to do? How are you going to come to a place where I want to do this? I, I, I like the results of my studying the Bible. I like the taste of it. And so I'm going to eat God's Word. I'm going to do it regularly. You may even say, I, I don't recommend it, but you may even say, I, I know I could do every day, but I'm not going to do every day. I'm going to do every other day. Or I'm going to do three days a week. So if I get to the fifth day and I haven't done Bible study, then I am for sure going to do it that day, the next day, and the seventh day. Because I know I could do all seven days, but I'm going to for sure do like that, right? Or you could say, I'm going to do five days a week, and my goal is going to be I'm never going to get to the sixth day, and I haven't done the first five, the five days. Where You set your pattern, whatever it's going to be. And then I would like you to bring that pattern next week. I know you won't have, you won't have any great success stories if you, unless you were already doing it, right? But if you bring that pattern and make that commitment publicly, we're not going to go around the room and say, what's yours, what's yours, what's yours? But we're going to let people speak up and say, okay, this is what I'm trying to do, and I'm asking God to help me. And then we're going to have a little time of prayer together that we will meet those goals. Okay? So set a realistic goal for yourself. If somebody comes in here next week and they say, I'm going to study the Bible two hours a day, seven days a week, we'll pray for that. But if you're not already doing that or if you haven't built up to it, I find it extremely unlikely that that's going to be your goal. Okay? So what is a realistic goal and then you do it. Now, I say built up because you could go five five minutes a day, every day of the week, and then you go, you know, I can do that. Five minutes is kind of boring. I can do more than that. So then it's 10 minutes a day, every day, right? Or you may go five minutes a day, every day of the week, 
and I'm only hitting like four out of four or five. But you do that for three or four weeks, and then it's five or six. You do that for three or four more weeks, and then it's all seven days, five minutes. And then five minutes isn't quite enough, and now it's seven days, ten minutes. You can discipline yourself with heavier and heavier weights than the word, okay? So, if somebody has something that was really passionate that you wanted to talk about, that you really felt like the Lord shared you, with you, we're, I'll let you do that at this time. Otherwise, and I'm, somebody might have been loading a video, maybe. Um, otherwise, we're going to pray together and move on. Okay? The reason I brought this up was because last week, we, we've been talking about, here's how easy it is, here's how easy, how, how easy it is, and yet I'm fishing, waiting for people to kind of latch on, but I'm going to do it. And I know a couple people have. Oh, my. She's in a phase. Okay, anyway, but I'm hoping for a high percentage of us, all of us who would say that we are believers, will have some models of how we're going to study and discipline ourselves. That's why I brought it up that way. Okay? Did somebody have something they're passionate about? All right, Alicia. I just had a really short, funny video that I wanted to share. Um, I thought about it um, when we were doing the motion. Some people were doing them, and some people weren't. Some people were laughing, and other people were doing them. Um, and Everyone praises God in their own way. Yep. Um, and this video also makes fun of people doing things in church. But I just want you to think of it as you've got to find what works for you. You don't have to be the one in the front of the room doing crazy dances. But you've got to find something. We are commanded multiple times in the Bible to praise God. Amen. We need to figure out how we do that. This is just a funny video that shows All right. that. Tommy. It's muted. How we need this out. <laughs> I feel like you got to join right in, okay? Start slow. we got a lot of different... But hey, if you're not used to going to hand-raising church, you want to go and join us, feel free to join us, but don't feel like you got to join right in, okay? Start slow. we got a lot of different hand-raises that we use. We actually have names for our hand-raises. I'm going to walk you through real quick, okay, what they are, just to let you know. So here at my church, music is rocking. Start slow. Hands in the pockets, little elbow flap. You're fine. Very subtle. Get warmed up. Get your heart rate up. When you're warmed up, start with the first one. Ready? Carry the TV. Carry the TV. That's our first one. Very subtle. Go to big screen. Big screen, little wire. Next one's my fish was this big. My fish was this big. If you're a liar, you go out there, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Jesus loves you. Grace. Next one's hold my baby. Hold my baby. Got dueling light bulbs. That's the next one, dueling light bulbs. I just thought it was a funny example on how people do things differently. We're not considered a hand reading church. I've been to those. But you have to do something. And looking down at your phone or even drawing on a piece of paper, that's not worshiping God. That's not praising God in the way that we should be at some point. You at least need to be engaged in paying attention. Amen. And just for the record, this, this area right here, definitely hand raising. So anybody, if you, if you want to enlarge this area and add to the hand raising, you go right ahead. Look at that right here. Right. I'm a hand raiser. Go ahead. All right, we got a video coming. Another video coming. Maybe. Hopefully. Maybe don't work. Just a quick encourage word. It's really just about. It'll work. Why it's plugged in. But okay. Now we don't have this long story. But if you want to know more, it's just about the diversity body of Christ. What the body could be, what the body is, and uh, the body that, that, that needs it. So that's kind of what it's about. Amen. Lights. Lights. Oh, shit. Are your lights are still coming? All right, let it up, let it up. It's right in the corner. I said it's right in the corner. Hey, miss it. All right, I'll catch you all in a minute. Matt, this one's going to hit him right here. So many people huh, are on the side. Don't even know them, even though they might have heard of God. Yeah, Can you love me? Uh -huh. Will he hear my prayer? Oh, I think I'm ugly when he sees my clothes and sees my hair. I heard of the Savior, so I'm turning red and died. As he gave up my sins and he gave me his life. And I wonder for me if he won't even care. Right now, I'm thinking back to when we first got down. I only crow when you search, I found. Snatch a wink, though you knew how I acted. 
shit, that's what's it. I was a big that you drafted a backflip, but a split couldn't be more backwards. In fact, that's classic. I love to see your tactics, but I think back to when I shrink back. When the real beat is real deep, I really thought you could never feel me. Cause my shirts were double X, when really I was a small devil shirts for the effect. When really it wasn't called for. Hands back, you would sag and drag on the floor. But I was never that poor to show the back of the drawers. But I did hang, kick slang, me and my boys did. Rock new act till I put a crease in our foreheads. And on the surface of the set, we were workers. But I'm glad you purchased the lumber set, you made it your purchase. Ah. So many people who are inside, don't even know, even though they might have heard of God. Yeah. Can you love me? Uh, Will you hear my prayer? Don't think I'm ugly when he sees my voice, he sees my hair. I heard of the Savior, heard he let him die. He can live with my sins and he can get his life. And I wonder for me if he won't even care. When he sees my clothes, oh, when he sees my eyes. I meet so many people, never heard of the name. Yeah, they heard the word Jesus, but never heard of his name. They feel cut off from them, not just because of the sin, but because of their clothes, hair, or their color of skin. And they've been afloat, drowning in sin, rubbing a boat. Yet they've never been approached, because we see him as different folks. God's all for universal. Yeah. He wants you in a circle. Yeah. He wants you in a new rag. And he wants you in a purple hair. Yeah. Now you can just take the curse of me. Plans at the word to see. God made the plans of diversity. Is there one godly ethnic group in the church? Should we all wear one polyester suit or maybe rock sandals and robes? No hammer supports. When we meet, maybe we should only eat salmon and loaves. Should we only like the organ or the violin? I'm in choir men, I'm in my men, up in the choir men and women. But what one minute, why do some people assume that? God's I buy, got no tunes, they got the boom back. He's with white, with black, with black, with Asian, with rock, country jazz, with rap. So let's the outside, but God sees the inside. No matter your outside, to faith it'll come to the inside. The outside, but God sees the inside. No matter your outside, to faith it'll come to the inside. So many people are inside, don't even know, even though they might have heard of God. Can you love me? Will you hear my prayer? Don't think I'm ugly when he sees my clothes, he sees my hair. I heard of the Savior, heard he let him die. He can live with my sins and he can get his life. And I wonder for me if he will even care. When he sees my clothes, oh, when he sees my hair. Amen. I love the first, the first seven seconds of that video where he's talking on the phone and there's no way you're thinking he's talking to a few about going to church. And then you go, oh wait. And the question is not, why did I think he was not talking about people going to church? That's not even the question. The question is, why are we not talking about people going to church? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, let's pray together and then uh, we'll jump back into worship for just a little bit more and then go to his word. Um, Aaron, my son, my brother, would you pray for us as we hear Thanks. Lord, well, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, gathering us here yet again and, and allowing us to, to be here uh, to worship you. Week in and week out. Uh, thank you for the your that you've given us and pray that you would, you would lead us to grow in you and help us to commit to studying and, uh, and spend time with you.
So, real quick before the next song, that as a drummer for the praise team here, that's probably like one of the oldest songs that I've been playing with the group. And even though I've been playing it for probably close to a decade now, when we first started playing the song, I haven't practiced it in a long time, so I'm like, crap, how do I play this song? <laughs> I don't remember. So what Pastor Dan was saying about discipline is very important to always be well-versed, well-practiced, and, and disciplined. <laughs>
Yeah. All right. So, a little bit later, I gave a couple people a little couple pieces of paper with some stuff on it that we're going to do later. Um, so, this all came about over, I guess, the span of a few hours. And it's really something that I've been... I've been working on for quite a while. Um, not necessarily the sermon, but what we're going to talk about. Um, and as you can see, the titles don't be misled. And part of that is because in today's world, we are surrounded by so much bad information. <laughs> and it doesn't even have to necessarily be a full lie, just not the full truth. Mm-hmm. Like, first thing that pops into my head is news. The news won't tell you the full truth. They'll just tell you what they think is going to get the most views. And back before, I mean, years and years and years ago, that's not how it used to be. The news was supposed to be what actually happened, the actual truth of what happened. And now it's just, let's get it out there, let's sell it, don't care who it hurts, don't care who it offends, let's just put it out there. Because it's what the world wants. Um... Now, there are news places, I'm not saying that all of them are like that, there are still those that will do the right thing, but, I mean, it can go as far as your friends can give you bad information, even your own parents can give you bad information, let's, let's be real here, none of us are perfect. I mean, there's been a few times where I've told my kids something, and then I had to go back and be like, you know, I really shouldn't have said that, because that wasn't exactly right. And so, even us as parents can give our kids bad bad information so today like i said we that is the world we live in today we live in a world just swirling with bad and false information and we need to be aware of that um one of the things that i've been dealing with a lot lately is my kids like to watch things on youtube which i'll let them for a little while but then i cut them off because it annoys the crap out of me because there's so much stuff on there that they make videos of and they make it seem like it's real. And I had to have a conversation with Jason about it, and I I had to tell him, look, dude, just because it's on the internet, just because it's in a video, does not mean it's real. Because he was dead convinced that this thing called Siren Head was real. (laughs) And it was really absurd, but I told him, I was like, look, dude, just because there's a video of it does not make it real. I was like, you can make videos and have them look 100% real, and they're completely fake. I was like, so just because you see it on the internet or you see it in a video does not make it real. But I also told him, however, don't grow up to think everything is fake. Don't be a skeptic over everything because that's part of my issue is I have a hard time believing a lot of things. Like I need physical proof or I have a really hard time believing it. And that's just because of how I was raised and stuff that happened in the past, which we're not going to get into. But... You can see how even a small detail being missed can change the way people think. Now imagine if you're talking to somebody about trying to get saved and you want them to come to Jesus and you, they ask you a question and you don't know the answer but you give them what you think is correct. Well, that person might take that as the truth because you're supposed to be, I use that loosely, you're supposed to be smarter than they are when it comes to that stuff. So they will take that as a truth. And if they take that as truth and it's really not, then they will share that with other people and then it just spirals out of control. It takes one person to start a rumor. I mean, uh, high school kids know that. Everyone in high school knows that. It takes just one person to start a rumor. And then next thing you know, the whole school knows. Um... But what we're going to look at today is in Genesis chapter 3. Amen. Amen. Um, it's short. The text is short, but there's a lot in it. Um, it's only the si- 1 through 6, but there's a lot There's a lot to look at in here that I, I feel really led by the Spirit that this is something that, especially us as a church, needs to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Um. In verse 1 it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. 
And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any of the tree, any tree of the garden. So right there, you can already see there's a little bit of a little. He he's not fully lying, but he missed. He I guess what, what, what's the term? Um, twisted the truth. Because God did say that there was one tree that they could not eat of. But he said that they could eat of all the others. But there was just one tree, and that was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that they could not eat. Technically there were two. Yeah. Yeah. But this this is the one we're talking about. But yeah. I have that wrote down right here, actually. (laughs) But you can see how... He, he kind of just sneaks that in there. Like, didn't God say you couldn't eat of any tree? And then in verse 2, it says, The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. So now she is giving the serpent false information. Because God didn't say you couldn't touch it. He just said you couldn't eat of the fruit. Right. It was, I mean, if, they, if they're supposed to be there to tend to the garden and take care of it, they'd obviously have to be able to touch it, right? right? So God never told them that they couldn't touch the tree. They just couldn't eat of its fruit. So now the deceiver comes giving you a little bit of a twist of the truth and then you buy into that by doing the same thing. By not understanding what the truth really is. Then verse 3, going back to verse 3, it says, But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Then verse 4, it says, The serpent said to the woman, Surely you will not die. For God knows that in that day you eat from it your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And again, the serpent is not 100% wrong here because they're not physically going to die. And when I've, my own study, I've seen a lot of people think that that's what would actually would happen, is you would physically die if you ate of it. And that's what I'm, they thought was going to happen, was that you would actually die. So the serpent tells them, you wouldn't die. You'd still be able to live. You would just be like God, knowing good and evil. So, he's not necessarily lying. He's just not giving them the full truth. And a little bit later, we'll see why that's so important. And then, lastly, in verse 6, it says, When the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise she took from the fruit and ate it and she also gave to her husband with her and he ate so he played with the truth and then she looked at the tree and was like you know that fruit does look really really good She's like, it does look really good. You know, it, it might not hurt to take just one bite. It may not hurt just to, just to get a little bit of it. So it was her own desire that misled her. You can say it was her own heart that misled her, that, mis, that misdirected her to do something that she knew. They were both, they were both told, they, they knew that that was something they couldn't do. But it was her own desire, her own heart that wanted her to do it. That's right. And this is where it gets hard. Because so many times in our life, we get to a point where we're like, oh, that looks really, really good. I really, really want it. And first thing that pops in my head, impulse buying. Shopping online, it's a great tool. You just hit a button and you buy it. Because it looks cool, it's a really good deal, so you buy it. However, did you really need that thing? Because me, me personally, my thought is if I don't use it within the, a year, I don't need it. Like I have stuff sitting in my shed that's been sitting in my shed since we moved into our house eight years ago. And I haven't touched it since then. So it's like, do I really need it or is it just there to take up space? 
So this is when we have to be careful and we have to guard our hearts because our hearts are the biggest deceivers you will ever come across. Your own wants and desires are your biggest and hardest thing that you're going to struggle with when it comes to doing what's right. Um, and the reason I think, like I said earlier, we need to be careful with this as a church is because what is our goal as a church? What is our number one goal as a church? Represent God, reach the lost. Yeah, represent God, reach the lost. Is our number one goal making our numbers bigger? Is our number one goal making sure our bills are paid? No. So, so many times I read about churches that are all about, hey, we have to get these numbers, we have to get more people in here. You can have a thousand people in the church room, and I will promise you, not even half of those people are going to pay attention to a word you're saying. Mm -hmm. So, our goal as a church should never be to let's fill our church seats, let's have a big, awesome, flashy praise band. That should never be a goal. Our goal as a church is to reach the lost, period. To reach the lost, to, to help people get saved. That is our goal as a church. And we can do that with five people or ten people or a hundred people. That is up to God. But our goal as a church is should only be to reach the lost so they can get saved. That's it. We don't need to worry about our own personal wants and our own personal desires. When we are here and we do missions for the church, our goal is to reach the lost and let people get saved. Or at least have the opportunity to get saved. To at least give them that chance. Because when we were doing Madhouse a while back that little 10 15 minutes or so that we did a devotional sometimes that was the only church those people would get but they were there they were maybe listening maybe not but there was people there that were still there listening and if you have a crowd of 100 people and only one listens and gets saved that is worth it there's a thing that they do at winter jam and I'm fairly certain they've done it every year. It's a little video they show, and it's about go find your one. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Jesus left the sheep, left the 99 to go find the one. Because having, sometimes having one is better than having 100. If you have one thing that's really good, and our one thing that is really good is Jesus Christ. Having that is better than anything you will earn in this world. It is better than any lie that the media or friends or family try to portray you as good. Having Jesus Christ is the one good thing, the only good thing we need. <clears throat> I'm going to go get Aaron real quick. Aaron was going to help me, but he was with the kids. Um... So I have this little skit thingy and I wanted the whole reason I wanted to do this is because I want a little more of a visual of how how bad I guess and it can get with people being deceived not just by the world but by their own thoughts. This is something I wrote and it was challenging for me to write it because a lot of what's going on in here is a lot of what I see in people today. And I've heard stories of what happens. So it was hard for me to write, but at the same time, it's good to know because I still got it. <clears throat> but um, like I said, just listen to it. And I'll explain a little more after. Did you have one? Yeah, Tommy was one. You were two, right? Yeah. Okay, and you were three. Okay. okay. What's my purpose here? 
Nothing happens to me that is worth anything. I have no good friends. I'm so alone. And I might have my mom and my dad, but they don't care. They just yell at me and shove, shove all the bad in my face. Annoying and perfect, but it's hard to even try when no one cares. There is nothing left for me to do. Maybe I should just run away. Maybe I should just be alone for the rest of my life. No one cares anyway. I won't be even I won't even be missed. They probably won't even notice I'm gone. I should just run. Maybe I'll be able to find someone who actually cares. Even at school, everyone laughs and kicks at me. I bet they won't notice. But what if I run away and nothing changes? What if I find a new place and they still don't know that I'm there? I mean, that's how it seems like now, so I guess that's how my life is. Is there even any reason for living anymore? It doesn't seem like it. Maybe I should just end it all. No one cares. No one will even notice I'm gone. Hey, go ahead. You're right. No one cares about you. You are worthless and a nobody. Your parents hate that they had a kid at all. You know you ruined their plans, and that's why they yell at you all the time and fight with each other. Who are you? Why do you sound so familiar? I'm just here to tell you the truth. I've been here listening to you, and now I'm trying to get you to see that you really are nothing. It's your fault. No one cares about you. I think you're right. I can't take it anymore. I should just end it. My parents would be happier without me around. They can do they can do what they want to do. I hear them yelling that we can't afford to do things because of me. I hear them yell and talk. They would be able to do more without me. Yes, they would, and they don't care. You're just a mistake. You're a failure. You are nothing. You know what I've done. I've had enough. This world has no place for me. Wait, what are you doing? Put those down. What? What are you doing? Please stop. Don't do it. Who are you? What's going on? He's a nobody just like you. He'll lie to you. He means nothing as well. That is not true. I love you and have always loved you. I'm here. Just take my hand and I will give you strength to keep moving. You are loved. Please don't give up yet. It's too late now. Look at her. She's nothing. She can't do anything good. There is no purpose in her living anymore. What's going on? Stop yelling. I can't hear you. It's so hard to hear over your, your yelling. I am here. Just please grab my hand. I can make him stop yelling, but you need to help me. I will help you. You are so precious in love. I love you so much. I died for you. I want you to be free. All I need is you to trust me and believe in me. Also help me tell others the love, compassion, comfort, and joy I offer. You can't be serious. You really think this guy cares? If he really cared, where has he been all these years? You're right. I've never heard of your voice before. Where were you when I was getting beat and kicked? Where, why are you here now? I have been here, but this is the only time you have listened to me. I've been here trying to convince you that you are priceless. I tried to get you to hear me, but you didn't listen. Please just take my hand, and I promise you he will stop filling you with lies. How do you know who I am? How do you know what I've been through? I created you. I know everything you have done. I forgive you for everything you have done, and there is nothing that you have done to separate me, to separate me from my love. But I feel like, but I don't feel like anyone cares. I try to talk to people, and all I hear is quit making excuses and wanting attention. I try to get out, but no one understands me. See, you can't trust this guy. He doesn't know you. He's lying just like everyone else. There's no help for you. Stop yelling at me. Stop. Please stop. I can't take the yelling anymore. See, you can't beat me. I'm not going anywhere. There's nothing you can do to stop me. Please stop. Just stop. Take my hand. I will make him stop. Just take my hand. Please, I love you and I am here for you. I have always been by your side. I know what troubles you have and I am here to show you how your life has more meaning than you can imagine. How can I have meaning in this world when I can't even stop the evil inside me? That's right, you're weak. You're as strong as me. I'll beat you every time, you weak little girl. I'll always be stronger than you and you will never be able to beat me. Enough of you. Be silent. This is one of my children, and you might be strong, but I am stronger, and I will give her the strength to make sure you won't affect her anymore. What happened? Why is it so quiet now? What did you do? What do you mean I'm one of your children? You are my loved children. I'm here to show you how much I love you, and how with me you will have strength to make the evil stay away. I understand you might be weak, but with me you can be stronger than ever. With me you can live forever in heaven with the Father. I promise you that if you follow me and live the life I have for you, you will be happy. I will promise when it gets hard, I'll give you the strength to keep moving. Who are you? You know who I am. You have heard about me before, but you turned away. You have ignored me every time I've tried to show up. It's okay, though. I forgive you, and I'm still here begging you to just take my hand. I am Jesus. 
so sorry, Jesus. I have failed you. I have forgotten what I knew. I want to be good and not have a constant relationship with you. See how quiet it is now? I have given you the power to make sure it stays like that. Just keep me at the center of your heart and follow my ways. No one and nothing can take you away from me. I'll be with you always. Now is the time. This is the place to give your heart, mind, body, and soul to me and be chained forever. I will. I will do my best to make sure I don't leave you. I'm sorry I left, but from now on, I'm yours. Remember, though, you can't get rid of me. I'm still here, and I won't leave. You know what? You're right. I can't get rid of you on my own. I know you'll be here, and that's fine, because I have something better now. I have Jesus, and he can make sure that you don't overpower me anymore. So you go ahead and stick around, but you might want to understand something, and that is Jesus is here, and he is stronger than you. And now I have the strength to tell you to shut up and leave me alone. So, if you listen to that, how many times have you talked to a non-believer, and that is the argument they have with themselves? The fact that they're not good enough, that nothing matters... This is all lies. It's all lies that are put in our brain from children even that we're nothing, we mean nothing, that we're, we have no purpose here. These are the lies that people are fed daily. This is the stuff that some people have to go through every single day of their life. This same argument every day. The reason this hits me so bad is because this is an argument I have with myself all the time. I argue with myself all the time, am I good enough? I don't deserve this. I'm not good enough for this. This There's no reason for me being here. This is something I struggle with daily. And there's so many out there that have that same problem. And it's all lies that the devil uses to get you to step away from God. But we have something better we have a way to finish that argument and stop it. And that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can give you the strength to do things that you did not think was possible. And this is how it was a couple thousand years ago with Adam and Eve in the garden. They had that same problem back then. And then you get the question of, well, well, why is so much evil in the world? Well, the reason evil is in the world is because of that reason. Because God gave us the free will to accept all that false teachings, all these lies about ourselves. We have the free will to give that up now. If you accept Jesus in your life and you believe it in your heart full-heartedly that Jesus is real and He is your Lord and Savior, you have now the ability to get rid of all of that falseness in your life. Now, we can't walk with God like Adam and Eve did in the garden. But if you think about it, if you really think about it, we still can. Because we have the Holy Spirit now. God gave us the Holy Spirit when Jesus died on the cross so that now we have that internal person in us to tell us we're loved, to tell us we're cared about, to tell us we mean something. But we're not a waste of space. We have that now. And if it wasn't for Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden and the falseness that came in through the serpent, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have any Jesus. We wouldn't have the power we've got now to turn to the devil and go, get away from me, I have something better in my heart. But we have that now. So we need to wake up and realize that yes we are in a world full of I say it plainly full of crap and that's all it is it's just there's so much crap and bad in the world and then you got Christians who love Jesus who say they want to walk with Jesus but don't want to leave their house but don't want to go tell people Because the media has scared them into believing that going outside is going to get you killed. You know how many people die while they're asleep? I mean, think about it. You think about how many people die when they're asleep 
and how many people die outside. It's about the same. I think it's slightly lower, but it's really close to the same. So going outside and telling people about Jesus is not any dangerous than going to sleep. It's just that's the way we are forced to see it. Because it's shoved in our face every day. I've done... I'm starting this little experiment that I'm doing because I'm going to take a break from all kinds of social media for an entire two weeks. Just because I want to see how it changes things. How, if it's not being put in my face every day, how much that's going to change my view on things. And in those two weeks, the only thing I'm going to be focusing on is my Bible. Because, at the little, at, like I said, at the, the end of this skit right here, that evil is going to be here. It's going to be here. No matter what we do, no matter how hard we try to fight back, it is going to be here. There's nothing that we as human beings can do to get rid of that. However, if you are a Christian, you have the ability to get rid of that now. And now it is up to us to show other people how they can stop that war that is going on in their self, in their minds, to stop all the lies and all the crap. Um, there's a couple other things that I've wrote too, and my wife yells at me sometimes because a lot of what I write can get dark. And the way I described it to her is, well, if you look at the world we live in, the world we live in is a very dark world. And then, as I was writing this, I was like, you know, the world really isn't that dark. There's still a lot of good in the world. There's still a lot of really good people in the world. But those people never get any recognition. It's always the bad. It's always the evil things that get recognized or get portrayed in media. It's never the good. There is still a lot of good in this world and it is us up to us as a collective body of Christ to make sure that that good glorifies God. Because Jesus will never tell you a lie. You can look through the Bible, find all the hundreds of promises God has made and He has kept every single one of them. Heck, sometimes I don't make promises because I know I'm not going to keep them. It's really hard for me to promise something because I know that stuff happens, stuff pops up. So it's really hard to make a promise. God has made promise after promise after promise to us and has kept every single one of those promises. He sent Jesus and he's going to come back. Don't know when. Don't know how. Well, kind of, sort of, how. But even that's not 100%. Yes, this is exactly what's going to happen. But anyway. So, as you can see now, we have lies every day. Now we need to figure out what to do and how to get rid of all of that. And there's only one answer, and that is Jesus Christ. That is the only way you will get rid of all of that. All of that bad. Because what's funny is when Dan was up here talking a little bit ago, and I was talking to Miss June a little while ago before church started, before I got saved, I was a very mean person. I was a very mean person. And I'm still that very mean person. However, I have something now that shoves that mean person aside and goes, no, this isn't who I am anymore. It's still there. And every one of you in here still has that part of you that creeps up every now and again that goes, this is who you are, and you have to realize that if you are with God, that old you is not you anymore. That old person is gone. 
It still still might creep up there, but you know what? Let it, because then you can smack it in the face with a Jesus stick. Because Jesus will give us the strength to realize that that is no longer us. So a couple of points. Um, First off, is beware of the false information. And be careful where you get your information from. Um, Make sure you understand where you're getting your information from. And don't be afraid to do your own research. If someone tells you something, I'm not saying every little thing you hear, you have to automatically assume it's a lie. But if there's something that's a little out there that you're not quite sure about, look it up. Don't don't just assume it's a lie. Look it up and find out for yourself. Do your own research. Do your own study. And it's just kind of funny because that's our spiritual discipline is study. <clears throat> and ultimately, if you can't find the answer, turn to God. <coughs> But don't just assume because someone is saying it to you that it's true. And that goes for me. That goes for Dan when he's up here preaching. Don't just assume that what we're saying is 100% true. Because we're both just human beings. Or when anybody speaks up in the inspiration of moment, don't just assume what they're saying is fact. If you have a thought that something isn't right, look it up for yourself. And then you can come tell me because I want to know too. And then uh, second thing is don't spread false information. If someone asks you a question and you don't know the answer, don't make it up. Just say, I don't know. This is something I'm dealing with with my own kids because they have that I, I want to know things. So they'll ask me a question and then one of them will chime in with what they think is the answer. And they're close, but it's not quite right. And I have to tell them all the time, like, look, here's the deal. If you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know. And then go find out. But don't tell somebody that that's what it is if that's not what it is because then you're, you're lying to them. And this goes back to what I said a little bit ago. Could you imagine trying to tell somebody about Jesus and you give them wrong information? I mean, look at some of the churches out there that say you have to dress a certain way to come to church. Show me in the Bible where it says you have to wear a suit and tie to go to church. I mean, I'm pretty sure most of the people back then weren't wearing suits and ties to go to church. Most of them were honestly probably only wearing a piece of cloth to cover their private parts. Especially if it was hot outside. So, the other thing is, is you have to be a good person to get saved. That is completely opposite of what the Bible says. But this is what some of these churches are telling these people that, or you have to go to a priest in confession, or your sins won't be forgiven. Because the priest is the only one that can forgive you of your sins. Where's the power of God in that? If you can't go directly to God to have Him forgive your sins, then where's the power in that? You have to go to a person. But this is the kind of false information that some churches give out to people and they take it as truth. Which kind of leads me into the last point here. Learn the truth. And the only truth we need to know is Jesus was real. He died on a cross to save us from our sins. That is a truth we need to know. And if you want proof, he gave us a Bible with 66 books in it as proof. You look through that Bible, you will not find one, con- one thing that counter- contradicts the other. You will not find one lie. Every prophet that the prophets made in the Old Testament was made real, that it actually happened. There was, what, 300 and something prophets about Jesus? 
Yeah. So, and every single one of them came true. There's, there's no, oh, what are the odds of that happening? There, that, that just doesn't happen. We have access to an all-knowing God. So we have the best dictionary ever. We have the best encyclopedia ever. And that is Jesus. We have that now. So if you really want to know what the truth is, learn it. I mean, Ron, you, work, you do maintenance, right? Yeah. If you don't know how to do something, what do you do? Exactly. If I work on cars, if I don't know how to do something, I look it up. I mean, if you didn't know how to, if you didn't know how to play a song, Tim, what would you do? You look up the music, right? Yeah. So we use this skill every day of if we don't know something and we need to know it, we have to look it up somehow. So why aren't we doing that with our Bible? Why aren't we doing that with God? If there's things we need to know, why aren't we looking it up and asking God? Instead of asking friends or relatives or even a pastor, look it up first. Because maybe God will show you something absolutely amazing and then then you can go to somebody else and say, hey, I looked this up, I want to make sure this is real. And then you and that person can look it up and if they come up with the same thing, chances are a little bit better that it's actually real. So I'm not saying dismiss everyone in your life and take everything that's given to you as a lie. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if you have those doubts, learn the truth. Look it up. Do your research. Do your studies. I mean, Ricky just started a job at HVAC. Did you know anything about HVAC before you started that job? Yeah. So you have to learn a lot. And it's... (laughs) <laughs> and that job's completely different than what you used to do, huh? So, but you're learning. You're getting better. As Christians, that's what we need to do. We need to learn and get better. So in a way of closing, what it all boils down to is trust God. When all else fails, when everything else is falling around you, trust God. Because you have to be very careful of the information that is out there. Because there's a lot of bad information. I mean, if I'm working on a car and I get bad information, I do something and that car breaks down, I, it could kill someone. If I'm doing brakes on a car and I forget to do something like tighten a bolt, that brake falls off and it could kill somebody. In life with God, it could kill you. If you don't learn enough about what you're supposed to do, it's going to kill you. Not physically, maybe, but mostly mentally, it will kill you. Like I said, that little that little skit I had came out of my head because it's so many times I I hear that question pop up. Well, what's my purpose here? What, why am I here? Our purpose here is to glorify God. It has been that way since the beginning. God never wanted us to live this life we're living now. He wanted us to live in the garden, happy, free, no worries. That's how He wanted it. But I don't want to say, I, I mean, this is the only way I can think of but I guess the only mistake is God gave us free will. I don't want to really say I don't know if it's really a mistake because God doesn't make mistakes. But that's the only word I can think of at the moment. He gave us that free will to accept all this bad in our lives. So as we leave and we go about the rest of our week just remember what the truth really is. And that truth is, Jesus died for you, He loves you, and He cares about you. And this life we're in right now, whatever crap you're going through, you're not alone. 
You don't have to be alone. God has always been here. He's always been with us. But it's up to us to listen. Like earlier in that little skit thing, God said, I've always been here. Jesus has always been here. But it's up to us to actually listen to what he's saying. Don't just shove him aside when you're, when you're feeling all right. Because when that bad comes in, it's going to come in like a freight train. And God's still going to be here. But his voice is going to be a lot quieter than what you think it will be. Because he wants us to listen. Now there might be times where God's going to yell in your ear and it hurts your head. But a lot of times that I've heard, in my personal experience, a lot of times I've heard God talk, it's very subtle. It's not very loud and very... Like banging in my head. It's very subtle. It's very calming. But if you're buying into all these lies and all this false information, all that is going to be louder than God. So we have to be able to listen. Because, let's be frank, none of us deserve to get into heaven. I mean, all the bad things we've done in our lives, none of us deserve heaven. Not a single person on this earth deserves to get into heaven. And yet, that is where God wants us. He wants us to get to heaven. He wants us to be up there singing praises. Not having any pain anymore. Not worrying about health concerns or bills or a car or a job. All that goes away. In the blink of an eye. You die, all that stuff, poof, gone. And then we'll really know the truth of who God really is. There will be no more questioning yourself. There will be no more questioning your faith. You will know 100% sure without a doubt every single moment for eternity that this is where you belong. And this is how it was meant to be. And honestly, I think that is the greatest truth that has ever existed is the fact that we know our end game. We know where we're going. As Christians, we know that we're going to end up in heaven. It might be a rocky road to get there, but we know where we're going. So this, everything in the world right now, this is all temporary. This is not your home. Your home is in heaven at the right hand of God with Jesus singing praise. That is your home. That is our end game. And that is the truth. And if you don't believe it, you can look it up for yourself. But that is the truth. Don't care what anyone else says. Don't care what the world says. I know in my heart, without a doubt, that that is true. And now it's up to us as a church to spread that truth. Well, I'll have the praise team come up here and sing a song and then but I want you guys to like I said I want you guys to understand that for one a little side note we don't know what's going on in people's lives so when someone's having a bad day and they seem grumpy they're not mad at you they might not be mad at you but you know what Go oh, hug him. Tell him you love him. Ask him, hey, what's going on? You seem a little off today. Because you don't know the battles that they're facing. And it's that everywhere. I mean, you don't know the battles, what people's going on. You don't know what's in their life. You don't know the stuff they're dealing with. This is why God tells us to love always. Because we don't know the hearts of everyone out here. But if we love on them, Maybe they'll go, hey, why is this person being so nice to me? And then there's your opportunity to tell them.
Thanks for joining us for this episode of New Heights Fellowship Baptist Church of East Toledo. And I ask you to study your Bibles and don't be deceived. If you're interested in more information about the church, you can check us out on churchtoledo.com. You can download our app, the Life Station and Church Toledo, New Heights Fellowship Baptist Church, now have an app. That app is Life for Toledo, and it's the number four. So it's L-I-F-E, the number four, T-O-L-E-D-O, Life for Toledo. And everything that we can do on our website and a lot more are on that app. And so you can get it on iOS or Android. And I hope you'll get it and use it and spread the word. We'd like to get a lot of people downloading the app and uh, trying to create a community in which we can help one another and grow and encourage. The Encourage Me application is on there if you're interested in getting encouragement calls for free through the Ministry of the Southside Life Station and Northwest Ohio Baptist Association. The uh, donation application is on there. The employment application is on there. The, it's just tons of information and opportunities to get free groceries if you're in the Toledo area. And so 